G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. Welcome, everyone. Today, I'm interviewing Mark Cooper, who is the CEO of Cooper Automotive, based in Tasmania, Australia. So thanks for your time, mate. Thanks, Michael, and thanks for having me on the show. Much appreciated. Now, I look forward to the chat. We met each other five or six years ago at Collins SBA, where I work as a business coach, and you're now a client, and we've done a little bit of work together. That's the sort of the backdrop of our relationship. So let's kick off with telling the audience a bit about your business. Yeah, thanks, Michael. So uh, Cooper Automotive is my core business, um, which, as it's says is in the automotive industry. We carry out mechanical servicing and repairs, a number of workshops in Tasmania. Uh, we've got seven Cooper Automotive Service Centres, a tyre power, a 4x4 shop called Tassie 4x4, and also another automotive business which essentially does the same as, as Cooper Automotive, which is mechanical servicing and repairs. So that's kind of a brief outline. There's, there's a little bit of a background story that, that goes with that expansion, which I'm quite happy to elaborate on for listeners if you'd like me to go into a little bit more detail about that journey. Now. Well, how did you, I guess you talk about Cooper Automotive, I mean, what sort of triggered that starting that off and it was a little bit of a story around that journey. Yeah, okay. It's interesting because I always wanted to have my own business. I guess that comes from being in a family where your father runs businesses. So dad had two mobile service stations down here in Tasmania. And during those early days when I was in high school, I used to work in those service stations and I would fix two strokes. This is probably talking old school now, but I'd, 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 I'd fix two strokes, fill gas bottles, I'd, I'd pump fuel on the driveway, clean the workshop, fix punctures. So that was kind of my sort of uh, road into the automotive industry, I guess, and also experience. Of, of a small business. I didn't, at that stage, I, I uh, didn't know I wanted to run a business. I became a motor mechanic first off. And through that journey, I realized I had a passion for business. I went to Queensland for a little while. And when I came back from Queensland, I got a job running an automotive workshop down here in Tasmania, which was uh, Lynn Gigney Automotive, which is long gone now. So I was managing the workshop, worked my way up to workshop foreman in that workshop. And then Rodney Howe from Howe Automotive tapped me on the shoulder and said, would you like to run a workshop for me? I said, yeah, that's exactly what I want to do. I'd, I'd love to do that. I I jumped across to run his, well, new workshop. So he had one already and the landlord of that one said, I've got another site. Would you like to take it on? So Rodney rang me to start that, well, to manage that business for him. But I was going to say start because it was pretty much start. I went over to that, that particular workshop, which was for those who knew, know Tasmania and I don't know how many listeners would, but it's on the eastern shore in Harra and it was behind a uh, BP service station on Clarence Street. When I got there, it was an old school service station. They had two work bays facing the petrol pumps I remember vividly standing against the workshop wall going, gee, I'd like some work. It was ground zero when that business started. I ran that for Rodney for about 18 months and took it to a point where I really couldn't do it by myself. I was starting early, I was working late. And I said to dad, I said, I want to get my own business or a conversation to that effect. And he said, well, why don't you buy that business off Rodney? And I said, he won't sell it. I've only just got it to a stage where it's making money for him. And he said, well, nothing ventured, nothing gained. And I said, well, I don't have any money. He said, I'll lend you the money. Conversation occurred. It was an interesting conversation but it ended up with the purchase of that business for $10,000, which I borrowed off my father at the time. When it comes to funding the business, that was that was funded off a family loan. And within six months, I paid that back and not long after employed my first employee, which was an apprentice. How old were you when that all transpired? At that particular stage, I was 28. Not young, but not old. I guess it's probably a good time for me because I'd had a little bit of life experience at that point in time. And the timing was pretty right, I guess, for me to take that challenge on. You see, that was basically you took it on by yourself as the sole owner, um, supported by your dad who funded it. Yep, so started as one, as, as a yeah, single uh, sole trader, doing the books, the invoicing, uh, the mechanical repairs, absolutely everything. Marketing probably fairly poorly at that stage. So yeah, that's where it started. And five years later, when the business was pretty good, we started out, well, fairly low on the, on the sales. Initially, of course, being a one-man operation, but I built it to a point where it was pretty successful within five years and I was able to pay myself a decent wages. And I received a phone call from David Cooper and uh, no relation. And David's no longer with us today, unfortunately. But he was a uh, Mercedes Benz and Volvo specialist in Hobart, technically West Hobart, but on the fringe of the Hobart city. And he was a short man and very bombastic and forthright. So I got to know David over a number of years. I'd call him up around a few Mercedes Benz we'd have come through the door. And he'd 
always say in his booming voice, you shouldn't be touching that stuff. You don't know anything about Mercedes-Benz. And then he proceeded to tell me how to fix it. We struck up a bit of an odd relationship. What happened is one day the phone rang and it was David Cooper. And he said, you want to buy my business? I said, not really, Dave, but I'll come and have a look. That was the start of the second one. I went and had a look at that business. And and he wanted to get out because April 2000 and GST was coming in. And he was scared stiff of GST. I actually purchased that business freehold. And it was $305,000 for the business and the property, which was on the fringe of Hobart, which is quite a significant property. So at the time, it was a reasonable price at the time, but little did I know it would be so valuable later on. That was my second business. And that was David Cooper Automotive. And at that stage, I was trading as Mark Cooper's, which started out as Mark Cooper's service and it got shortened to Mark Cooper's. And after about 12 months, I went, this is ridiculous. I got two trading names, twice as much marketing, different processes and systems. At that stage, I decided to drop the David and call it Cooper Automotive. And because I was Mark Cooper's, then both businesses became Cooper Automotive, which is when the Cooper Automotive brand essentially was born. That worked out well, didn't it, sort of, (laughs) in some ways? It was handy because the Cooper was in both names. It was pretty much a no-brainer, and it removed my first name from the business. Cooper's a little more generic or popular, I like to call it. (laughs) The surname worked, but it wasn't not so tight that I'm locked into the business should I wish to sell it down the track, I guess. so. And then, without sort of going into the the detail, you now, how many Cooper Automotive sites have you got? Well, we've actually currently got seven. We did have eight. We found with the skill shortage and an offer too good to refuse that it was not worth hanging on to one of our northern suburb sites. So we sold that one and that made the business a bit bit stronger. We've currently got uh, one still on the eastern shore. The original site's now moved. So that's in Mornington, not Harrow. I've got one in Hobart, one in Kingston. We've got one in Moona, one up in Launceston in Invermay, one at uh, Lindisfarne. That's one in North Hobart. So we've got, yeah, those are the stores that we've currently got now. So seven all up operating under Cooper Automotive brand. Yeah, and mostly in southern Tasmania. I guess, do you have any sort of key numbers you can share to show the growth of the business? Obviously started from ground zero. It was just yourself. You've got seven stores today. So any other numbers you'd happy to share with as far as illustrating the growth? From memory, when I was a sole trader, it was less than $400,000 in sales for that first year. I vividly remember taking less than a mechanic's wages for about the first three years. So it was pretty tight in those early days. The business actually reached a peak of uh, $12 million in revenue. And then we sold the uh, the paint shops just this year, actually. So now we've dropped back to around about $10 million in revenue with around, well, we actually got 57 employees currently down off our peak because we obviously lost a few employees on the sale of the paint shops. Yeah. You just touched on a few other businesses coming into the fold along the way. So maybe just share with our listeners sort of your thinking and strategy as far as bringing in other businesses, not just related to the core business of um, mechanical workshop. Yeah, look, this is probably a, a twofold lesson now that I look back on it. My thinking at the time was the automotive industry was and is going through a lot of change as we move towards electric vehicles and hybrids, but eventually through to different forms of power. It could be hydrogen, electric, a combination of. So the purchase of the paint shops are inspiration paint stores. There was one in Kingston and one in Mornington. My thoughts around acquiring those was around the fact that they were product driven and my business was labor driven and they're in a completely different sector. So it was more of a diversification strategy to the automotive industry become very tough to operate. I was in a different sector and a different style of business, which was in my mind at the early stage when I took that on, was as quick as you can scan the product, the more money you make. Now in reality, that's not exactly how it works, but the idea was that diversification. And also not only that, it was a little around challenging whether I was a one trick pony or I could run a different business. And my aim was to run that business and not work in it, which I successfully did. But well, in hindsight, as I said, it was a double-edged sword. It was kind of a good <coughs> diversify. But now that I look back, I would have been better being more focused in the core industry that I know well and where my actual core skills are. So I wouldn't know that that was the right move, Michael, or the wrong move. But it was something that happened. I had those shot for 10 years all up and only just recently sold them. So they were sold on the 1st of uh, August this year, 2023. I guess at the very least, it was an experience, right? It gave you some different learnings. But it's, but it's interesting as an example, because I guess coaching business over many years, I think that's it's not necessarily the trap, but I think the challenge is getting distracted so in some ways that was you got distracted and for good reasons at the time as you say that was strategically there but to your point you can get distracted from your core business in time and energy and the last thing you want is your core business to sort of go backwards not that you necessarily did but I think it is a good learning for businesses not part of that just being very clear on your vision and what you want to achieve and being able to challenge that from time to time and yeah sometimes you need external help to, to do that because sometimes you're, you're in the weeds. Yeah, exactly. Um, thanks for sharing that because I think that's a good
a good point. And you've got the other businesses which more related to the industry. Yeah, correct. I am one that likes a challenge and take on another business and see if we can do something with another brand or another business. But I've now, with the sale of the paint shops, our strategy is to focus back on core business, which is automotive. And I did purchase a tyre power business, only tyre power business in Hobart, actually. I purchased that in September 2018. So we've had that for around five years now. When I purchased it, it was losing money. The owners were past retirement, should have retired a little bit earlier, but didn't quite know how to go about that, that retirement process. So when I bought it, it was losing money. In the first year, we doubled the sales. In the second year, we doubled the sales again. We successfully managed to ramp up that particular business, but we were still losing money. A bit of a core learning out of this one, and this is a good thing about acquiring businesses, adding on, buying group franchises. You get all this additional experience and know-how on the journey. It costs you a bit of money, an expensive education, but if you apply that, which we have to the core business, in the long term, it'll end up in front. Now, what I worked out was that we had constraints around the building that we were in, which I didn't really realise we took that on. It didn't really have much in the way of car parking. And automotive businesses need car parking unless the customers are waiting in the waiting room and then take car with them, which happens a little bit in tyres, but in town, parking's at a premium, so the customer will just leave the car with you for the day and they've got parking for the day. When I had a look at this business and I said, right, let's map out whether we're going to actually make money out of this business. I worked out it was a self-defeating prophecy in a sense is that when we got to the number of cars we needed to actually service and fit tyres on versus the number of car parks we had, the car parts started to take up the working base, which meant you could never actually generate enough revenue out of that site to make profit. We had to relocate tyre power. We relocated that to North Hobart, which is in a really good location with a really good large workshop now, and we'll only just hit profitability this year. So that's been a five-year journey. If we hadn't had to move the business, we'd have been making money before now, but relocating the business obviously made that a little more complicated. A good lesson in that one, we were able to do what we wanted to achieve, but we're only just about to make profit, so it's cost us a bit of money on the journey. Yeah, I think a good point out of that too, it's not necessarily about revenue, right? It's about profit at the end of the day. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, that's a lesson I'm still learning, and heard the saying, I think you've said it too a few times, uh, Michael, to me, is that I think it's, what is it? Uh, revenue is vanity, profit sanity, and cash flow is king, I think yep. is the way it goes, and that's 100% yep. correct. One of my favourite sayings, you start out in business, and it's particularly if you start from scratch, I mean, you just after any revenue, right? Anyone with a heartbeat basically is a yep. customer or a client that's trying to, in growing a business, so you've got to come out of that mindset as not just revenue, it's about profit, making sure you're across the key levers to drive that. It's a good point you raise. You've done a lot to the business environment to date, essentially started your own business, grown it significantly, brought in some other different types of business. Has there been a moment you felt like you succeeded so far? That's an interesting question. One stage, at about the five-year mark, when I was able to pay myself a wage over and above a mechanic, I was pretty happy at that point. There was a level of success at that five-year mark, but then I went on to purchase more businesses and continue to grow, which as you would know, and maybe a number of listeners would know, that takes a lot of cash. So all of a sudden I became poor again for a while. I don't know that I really would say I've actually succeeded. It's a journey. When you think about success in business, I don't think there's an end. It's about taking on the next challenge, improving the business, the one percenters, the growth. Maybe the end will be the telltale. When I retire, I guess I'll be able to measure whether I've, I've been successful on the journey or not. But a hard one to answer. I think there's businesses like a roller coaster. One minute you think you've got it all sorted and the next minute you've got issues and it's all hands on deck. Yeah, I think it is a hard one to answer as a business owner entrepreneur because I think there might be different sort of points along the journey you feel like succeeded, but it is a journey in what you say and there's ups and downs like you say, but have you got any sort of clarity around what success does look like for you? Is it retiring with financial freedom or... Success to me, to be honest, I'm not, I've only just really started to think about retirement lately and I'm not sure that I like the idea of retirement, not fully. Success to me is a business that I can have running in the background and with my mentorship and input, continue to keep that business on track and keep it growing and keep it strong. Now, that to me is success, autonomy from the business. I can come and go as I please, but still have the joy of increasing revenue, profitability, supporting the team. To me is success, the ability to be able to come and go and not be chained to the business on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, that makes sense. I think it is for business owners, the word retirement tends to sort of be a bit of a dirty word because it's just by nature you want to be doing stuff. So it's not like you just want to sell up one day and sit on the beach because I'm sure you wouldn't do that. Maybe you might ride your bike a bit more, maybe. Yeah, yeah, I might ride the bike a bit more, that's for sure. I did try and go down that track originally because originally I set Cooper Automotive up as a franchise. So it was a fully franchise model. In fact, I did franchise it out in 2008, I think from memory, we had a, a franchisee 
just won the test the system and the system was very successful. So my original plans were to go national with Cooper Automotive. And there was a few factors that, that made me think otherwise and a couple of key points. One was a bit of a business scare around 2005 where I, I nearly went, went broke. And in 2008, the GFC hit us pretty hard. And then the clincher for me over the journey with Cooper Automotive, I spoke to Ultratune on the mainland. I, I knew a guy that was pretty high up in Ultratune and I asked if I could come and have a look at their operation because they weren't in, in Tasmania and to see how they did it so I could sort of model or improve my franchise system based on their processes. They tried to court me and basically get Cooper Automotive to convert to Ultratune. It was never going to happen. That was never my intent to convert over to another franchise system. I decided to create my own. That was fine, but the next iteration after that was Midas pursued me in 2008 and asked if I would expand their brand through Tasmania, which I sat down and had a chat with them. I had a look at and at the time I couldn't work out how they were making money. And I went to, I'd only just finished a, an degree at the University of Tasmania, actually, and a graduate certificate in commercialization. Pretty up with accounting and finances and so forth. So I had a look over their stores and their numbers. So I asked them to send me the good, the bad, and the ugly, and he sent me something else. And I went, that's suspicious to start with. I looked over the numbers and I went, I can't see how they're making money. So I sent it to my accountant. I said, can you have a look at these numbers and tell me what you see? And his words come back to me, he says, I don't know how they're making money. I said, thank God, neither can I. So mm-hmm. on the 24th of December, 2008, they went into receivership. What that rammed home to me was that it doesn't matter how big you are, they had 80 stores. It doesn't mean you're bulletproof. You can still fail. And that coupled with a couple of financial scares, a young family, I decided to not expand around Australia. And that's why just recently we purchased back that franchise store and became fully owned again. Well, I fully own the whole group again and have full control over it and decided that we'd be a big fish in a small pond and continue to trade strongly in Tasmania. That's a good story because it's not irregularly I talk to business owners that have that grand plan of franchising. I sort of uh, tend to challenge it as much as anything. So he's hearing his story is important. I think it's been very clear on that outcome. If you're going to do it and, you know, like you say, you sort of came across challenges and here you are today. So again, part of that sort of ups and down the learning curve, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the key thing is with franchising, people need to realise it's not a silver bullet. In fact, mm. I'd go so far as to say silver bullets don't exist in business. Using <laughs> having good systems and processes and 1% increments past that, there is no silver bullet. And the other thing with the franchise system is there's a lot of snouts in the trough. Everybody wants to feed. So you've got to make sure that everybody gets their share, but the customer still gets exceptional value out of what you offer. And that is a really tough game to play. Yeah, no good points, mate. So what's the number one thing you'd recommend to marketing a fast-growing business? Probably not going to give anything new on this, but I can probably reinforce, I'd imagine what a lot of business owners would say when they've been on a a reasonable sort of a business journey. Brand is number one. Your brand needs to be strong and it needs to be well recognised for what it provides and that brand will carry you a long way. For example, the Cooper Automotive brand is a pretty good example here in Tasmania. When we would open a new Greenfield store, which we haven't done for a little while now, we've gone on a bit of an acquisition trail, uh, but when we'd open a Greenfield store, I could take a, a shed or a warehouse, put up Cooper Automotive signage and we do in excess of $20,000 a month in sales from a standing start. Now, if you had any other business, Joe Blows Mechanical, and you, you opened it up and put some signage on the door, you would not get $20,000 worth of sales from a standing start per month. Now, that's not enough to make the business profitable, but it's certainly enough as a base to grow from. I think brand is number one. To be really clear around what your brand stands for, what it provides consumer, why people want to use your brand. So brand's really important, which comes back to your customer value proposition. And your customer value proposition is around solving a problem for your customer or providing them something in a way that the competitors is not providing to the customers at that at that point in time. That customer value proposition, a strong brand, and then listen to your customers. That's a good point. The takeaway there, particularly, I think, that you've raised is be different to your competitors because there's no point being the same. You're not going to stand out. And like you say, being very clear on your, your value proposition, very good insight and a very good tip. You funded your business via your dad when you kicked things off many years ago. Along the journey, have you used any other sort of funding to to grow the businesses? Not to grow the businesses. Originally, I really didn't like debt. As I said earlier, I paid that $10,000 within six months of buying that business as the first bit of debt I'd ever had. Generally, the business has been funded by profits and my money going back into the business. So whether that's a reduced wage or investing back in the business when I could pay myself a decent wage, but pretty much self-generating to some extent. I did take out a bank loan once when I purchased the, uh, the paint shops back in 2013. And the reason I took that loan on is that business was very stock intensive. It had $800,000 worth of stock holdings, essentially finance the stock. But I would be very cautious as a business owner with bank funding. You need to understand
understand what the covenants of the loan, we had to provide quarterly financial reports to the bank in a certain format. So there was quite onerous on the business to be able to provide the bank with these ongoing financial reports. As soon as I could get that loan down to a point where we no longer had to do that, that was kind of a key event for us, I guess. And based on that, I'd prefer not to borrow money where I can avoid it. I have borrowed money to grow a property portfolio, which has been strategic around business expansion, kind of like the McDonald's theory, I guess. It's not necessarily around the business, it's around the property that sits behind that business. So that was not only builds a bit of wealth and ability to be able to borrow money and expand that property portfolio, it also gives you security around your business locations, which is why we've gone down that track. Yeah, no, good one. So if you were to start up today with plenty of funding, would you go into your industry? Yeah, look, I, I would. It's a fast changing industry. You can have two schools of thought around a, a fast changing industry. You can see that internal combustion engines will eventually phase out. And I say eventually because I don't think it's a fast journey. It's in the near future, but it's not the immediate future. The industry is changing significantly. So if I was to go into this industry again, I would go in with more around a mobility mindset than an automotive mindset. That may be e-bikes, it might be electric cars, it could be uh, motorised wheelchairs. I think it'd be really around how people get from point A to point B and build the business out on that mobility sector and try and grab pieces of that mobility. That to me seems like a logical progression of where the automotive industry is now. So yes, I would, but I would think about it a little bit different. Well, I guess like a lot of industries, they change, right? So it's a matter of being adaptable. So it's an interesting mind, you know, thought process you got there. Can you outline the most stressful point in your small business journey to date? Yes, kind of ground into the memory. <laughs> Probably the most stressful point, I think, I could pinpoint the most stressful time. You have ups and downs in business, so it's certainly a journey along the way where times are great and times are not so good and you wonder why you embarked on the journey that you did. The one that stands out to me most would be in 2005, I opened the third service centre. At that point, I was still forcing growth. It wasn't, we were, I was trying to jump ahead of the curve, so I was pretty light on money. I was taking risks and I opened up our third service centre in Lindisfarne managed to, to negotiate a pretty good lease. I did the fit out and so I painted the floors and I got it all ready to go. Put an ad in the paper to get staff. No one answered. They say the skill shortage is, is recent and I can tell you now that it's not recent for the automotive industry. In 2005, we had a skill shortage and there was no mechanics around that were on the market to be employed. Now, the issue there was I'd already signed leases. I'd already paid for the fit out and I only had enough money in the bank account to last me for two months and I was bankrupt if I couldn't fill that store. At the particular time, I was, uh, I've had a few people that have helped me out over the years and Mal Emery was a self-professed marketing expert but he had some really good ideas and he had this club that you joined, the Mastermind Club. I did learn a fair bit off him and we travelled around Australia doing different sessions and learning different things. It was a lot of fun. And I, I rang him up and I said, Mal, I'm in trouble. I need a mechanic and i will put an ad out and I've got no answer. And he said, well, show me the ad you put in the newspaper because it was newspaper back then. It wasn't seeking online so mm. much back then. I, I sent him, I think I actually might have faxed him the ad which <laughs> go, go on back another step. I sent it over to him and he looked at this ad, he reworded it and it came back and it said, I'll offer any motor mechanic that turns up for an interview $100. I went, well, that's pretty bold. You know, I have people turning up all over the place. And he said, well, no, not really. He said, because you decide whether you want to interview them or not. I went, oh, that's pretty clever. I put that in the Mercury, the local newspaper. I only actually interviewed one guy in the end, but what actually happened was that it was at the time where the government was wrestling with skill shortages. Funny how history repeats itself, but they were wrestling mm-hmm. skill shortages with like political hot potato. Now, I I hadn't even noticed this was a political hot potato. I was more focused on my space and the predicament I was in without a mechanic to sort of keep this business going. So the long and the short of it is the newspaper picked it up. I was on the front page of the newspaper. I there offers a hundred dollars for an interview. I was on talkback radio all around Australia. I've never actually seen anything like this before. I haven't seen it since. It was a media feeding frenzy. I had Hugh Nalon from 60 Minutes calling me. I had all the big names. I saved some of them on my phone. I thought that might come in handy later. This got a fair bit of air time. I ended up getting a uh, mechanic over from the UK. That was my first overseas mechanic that I employed. Now, he didn't come quick enough, but what actually happened is we found an intermediate solution around shuffling staff and to keep the doors open, and uh, he turned up not too much later, and that was enough for us to get over that hump. That was pretty scary, and the GFC, I guess, was probably the next one, which I think the GFC was 2008, but I don't think it really impacted us till about 2009 down here in Tasmania. Well, certainly 
certainly not the automotive industry. And we basically had next to no work for about 10 weeks. Had 12 weeks worth of cash flow. So I came within two weeks of another financial scare. And I guess if we we're talking about lessons, what I have learned, and it'll be different for industries and, and different sectors, is that you need a cash buffer that will get you through tough times and you need to kind of have some guidance on what that is likely to be. So I've worked out for the automotive industry, that's about 12 weeks. If you've got cash flow to get you through for 12 weeks, you should be able to trade through those tough times and come out the other side. Yeah, that's, uh, I think, uh, very good learning. Rather than just sort of fly by the seat of your pants with cash flow and just week to week, having that reserve buffer, be it 12 months overheads or whatever it looks like, I think is a really good tip to sort of embed into your business and your approach. Certainly some stressful points there. And the other thing, think that advertising ploy around the $100 for an interview is just a good example of being different, right? And I think that applies equally today. It frustrates me when I see ads in Seek or wherever and they're just the same old ads stand out. So you got to be thinking from potential employees' perspective, what's going to make them or well, grab their attention for start with and then obviously get to the, the interview and want to join your business. That's definitely a very important point because I think businesses talk about the challenge in getting good people. Like you say, one way or another, that's been always the case, but a lot of business owners are their own worst enemy and it can be self-fulfilling. Some good points and good learnings there, mate. Yeah, absolutely. That's probably part of being successful in businesses when people see you zag. Now, obviously, yeah. the right zag, if you're doing the same as everyone else, you're lost in the crowd. Correct. That's a real, real important takeaway for our listeners. Are you a small business owner? You know that getting recruitment right can make or break your team's success. Just one mishire can cost your business up to 27 times their salary. Finding and retaining top talent is a challenge, especially in today's competitive market. That's where our Ultimate Recruitment Toolkit comes in. Over 10 intensive days, our online course is designed specifically for small business owners like you. We'll walk you through the process of sourcing and securing A players for your team. Here's what you'll gain. Learn the proven strategies to pinpoint and attract the best talent in your industry. Access our comprehensive playbook filled with templates and tools tailored to fit your business needs and apply the resources right away to enhance your recruitment process and streamline hiring. Invest in your business's success by helping your management team become effective recruiters. Supercharge your hiring process today with the Ultimate Recruitment Toolkit, available at growersmallbusiness.com. So what area in business do you feel you've had to work on the most to add the greatest value? During my growth journey, what I found that added the most value for me was systems and procedures. Now, that sounds very boring, but if you're creating a franchise and you've got multiple locations and you want to get a step back from the business, you need pretty robust systems and procedures that people can follow, especially if you're looking at getting that consistency across multiple locations. One of the things I've had to work on most, it's not something that, that I enjoyed or I found easy, but I wrote the whole franchise manual for Cooper Automotive, right down to turning the lights on and firing up the computer and how you greet the customer and the process, the journey, I guess, that the customer goes on through the business with each interaction, making sure that was fairly tight. The trick is, though, with systems and procedures is you need to train people in how to use those and you also need to audit the systems and processes. Human nature is that we forget and we start doing it another way or we think we've got a better way to do it. So it's really important that you create the Bible, so to speak, but then you've got to make sure people are following those steps. But I think that added the most value to the business and allowed me to be able to take that step back that I otherwise wouldn't have been able to do for any length of time because the system would have gone sideways. Good to hear. And I think it's so important. It's such a big foundational piece to grow a business to have robust systems and processes. And like you say, always continually doing audits, review, uh, updating. Also too, no doubt like you have, is getting people outside yourself involved with that. Again, it doesn't revolve around you, but certainly uh, the ability to grow and provide consistency, which is a really key ingredient to, for great businesses. I'm glad you sort of mentioned that because it is a really um, important thing. And we, the platform you keep your systems and processes is also important how you save things because sometimes, you know, talk to businesses and they've got systems in place, well, they think they have, but it's just who accesses it, it's just a total mess. So it's actually uh, problematic. I think mm. you start with what's the platform and that might be Google, might be SharePoint. There are some great actual custom-made platforms out there. One of our business friend system hub is a great one that's been built with that in mind and it's so very efficient so certainly for our listeners if you're growing a business you know those systems and processes make it a priority 
Yeah, absolutely. You're right about the where you house it, especially if you've got multiple locations, it needs to be accessible in the cloud for all employees to grab and easy to search and find. We went through quite a few different programs on that journey and we've landed now, Guru is another good one, to house your systems and procedures. You've got to be able to access them quickly, efficiently. They've got to make sense. It's got to be easy, otherwise people won't follow them. That's right. And the other good point you made, there's no point having them if people aren't trained on them, right? So, Correct. So what have you enjoyed the least about managing fast growth? Probably the skill shortages has been the thing that I've enjoyed the least. People is the interesting part of business. They're the mm-hmm. most challenging, but they're also the most rewarding. It's really a tough one because if you haven't got the right people, business is hard. If you've got the right team, business is, is really easy and it, it just works. It's really important to engage your people, have the right people on the bus, making sure that they're also... Actually, during the journey, what I've found is that silos don't work. Now, that sounds fairly obvious, but when you've got multiple locations, it's really easy to create silos and silos find people only have parts of information and then they feel left out of the loop then they don't feel valued it's like nobody's listening to them what we've found is that it's really important that people come on that journey the communication is really consistent and clear and their input is taken on board and looped back to them around what happened with that input it's really important that the people are involved in that process like people can be the most challenging and the skill shortage is the most challenging thing that i've faced in business on my journey over the last 28 years and that's good Skill shortage is worse now than it ever has been. Definitely around uh, that skill shortage is the thing that I've certainly enjoyed least, but when you get the right people, it makes an incredible difference. Yeah, and that's a very good point in relation to people, which is a real conundrum sometimes, right? You know, most business owners would agree and experience that. So what do you love most about growing a small business? I actually like the challenge, <laughs> and there's plenty of that, I can tell you. So I really like the challenge of seeing your ideas and your business come to life. It's really exciting to <clears throat> be able to grow a business, have some ideas, be able to implement them and just watch your ideas and your hard work come to life. It's what gets me up in the morning is how can we do it better than the opposition? How can we provide something nobody else has provided? Just and taking ideas from other businesses or other completely different sectors. Can I tweak that and put that into the automotive industry? For argument's sake, probably uh, not a brilliant example, but I'll give you the McDonald's drive-through sticker. It hasn't been around for a while, I don't think, but you used to have a sticker you put on the windscreen of the car and it would give you a free Coke when you drove, went through the drive-through. In a marketing, with a marketing hat on, we wanted to get Cooper Automotive brand out and about, I came up with an idea that if we asked customers if we could put a Cooper Automotive sticker on the back windscreen of their car, if they allowed us to do that, we'd give them a free vacuum and wash. And then every time they come in for a scheduled service, we would notice that sticker and that would entitle them to a free vacuum and wash with their service. That allowed us to get that sticker on the back of the car and the customer got a free vacuum wash and it was a win-win. Now, I thought about that from a drive-through fast food sector. Grabbing, I love grabbing ideas that other industries are using and have been using for ages and seeing whether you can tweak or apply that to your industry or your business and you can get some really good ideas out of that. Absolutely, yeah. Thanks for sharing. That's a really good example. So what's the biggest mindset shift for you in your business growth journey to date, mate? It's an old cliche, but working on the business, not in the business. I found this incredibly hard, as I'm sure that most small business owners would. I actually enjoyed fixing the cars, but I wanted to grow the business. And in the end, I had to make a choice. I couldn't fix the cars and grow the business. It just wasn't working. I had to step back from that workshop space and allow other people to take on that work and spend more time on the business and growing the business, doing business plans, financial projections, those processes and procedures, just making sure that everything was in place for everybody to be able to do their job successfully and that the business was heading in the right direction and on a pathway for growth and success but it took me ages I kept going back into the workshop and fixing cars because I found that was an area that I enjoyed when I went in there to to be honest the stress just went away I only had to focus on that one thing in front of me Mm. not five or six or seven things that when you're running a business yeah I guess the the biggest mind shift was really just getting to the point of working on the business not in it I guess sort of looking back did sort of and you did go down the franchise model would that would have helped getting your head around all that because obviously a franchise you need to get all these things in place like systems and processes and structures communication software and the like which is all work on the business I think that's probably the best thing I ever did was franchise a business, even though it's not a franchise now. We've won 10 awards over the years, and those awards are off the back of the business being well ahead of where most small businesses would be. We punch way above our weight for the size business we are when we look at processes, systems, procedures, culture. Everybody thinks we're a large organisation from the mainland to the point where we've had to actually advertise we're Tasmanian-owned because they, they think we're a mainland business that's come down to Tasmania. As you'd understand, Michael, in Tasmania, there's a little mindset around 
support the local, I guess. That's definitely real in Tasmania. That franchising journey, it cost me hundreds of thousands of dollars and years and years of time to really work it out and understand it and put a model together that really worked. But it was the best thing I ever did. Yeah. So it's interesting when you think about it, it's like business owners wanting to grow their business, try and treat it like they're growing a franchise. So put all those things in place that a franchise would need. So I've never really thought about it, just sort of come to mind again. What's the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain? I would, you need to do create a habit around making decisions based on data and you need to have good data at your fingertips, whether that's industry data, ABS data, or internal data around your customers, your transactions, when you're making decisions around expansion, growth, products, what to offer a customer, you really start, need to create a habit around making decisions based on data and facts. Now, I'll give an example of that because I'm really good at shooting from the hip and it's cost me a lot of money over the years. I was was approached by an area manager of of a service station chain down here in Tasmania to take on a workshop. I looked at the workshop and it was only two bays. There was nowhere to put a reception area. I modelled this on an Excel spreadsheet and it told me I would lose money. And I went, okay, so I'll lose money but what if I get in an office and I put an office there so I went through all this scenario it still said I was going to lose money opened it up regardless and all the data and guess what I lost money so we ended up closing that store down and backpedaling that was a clear example of the data was there so I did take that step of using and analysing the data but then I didn't take any notice of it so I think you've got to use the data use the facts and then you've got to make decisions based off that data and that will give you nine times out of ten the right decision yeah very good point data very important but in setting up a new business or you know just operations and I guess that sort of somewhat comes to the financial model around your your business model and certainly being clear on those key levers that you need to pull on a regular basis and I guess that's the financial modelling is actually an important part of our business transformation program that we work with our small business owners in programs and we find that sort of understanding what that is and gives them a really good insight into those key drivers so they do make data driven decisions as you say and it's not just gut feel good point. Can you talk about how you added people to the team, sort of some wins, mistakes and advice for those listening? To start with when I was small, what I used to do was we'd wait until we were past capacity because we were bootstrapping at the time. So when we all started having to work back late would be when we would hire the next team member. And I found this worked really well because when the team was stretched, and you can't do it for too long or you'll burn the team out. When the team was stretched, we made a lot of money because when you put the next person on, you had that additional expense. What I also found is when you put that additional purpose, uh, additional person on, the business automatically grew to accommodate for that person. So the sales growth was there because you were already working over capacity so you already had enough early on I thought and it worked for me several times as I grew was just work till you're over capacity and then that's when you need to hire now as I've got bigger and gone through the growth journey it's been more around revisiting the org chart what do we need what's the next step for argument's sake uh, I now have a general manager we never had a general manager but when I looked at the org chart and we looked at how many people were reporting to other people and what sort of structure we needed to go forward we decided that a general manager was the next best step the organizational chart kind of informed who would be hired next on that basis. And I guess the last kind of piece of input I would add to that is attitudes nine tenths of the battle. Whenever we've hired and got it wrong, it's somebody who's got a different mindset to us, the wrong attitude, and that's ended up nine times out of 10 in tears. You can train people to do a job, but you can't train them to have the right attitude. Yep, and that's definitely hear that regularly, and I guess your core values are an important part of that, right? So being very clear on those values and making sure you're talking about them daily as far as your culture. And another good point about hiring with capacity, which is really about being proactive and not reactive. And when I had my own accounting firm many years ago, I used to work on that basis, and it always worked. You always filled it, and it gave you, as opposed to reactive, and always gave you a bit more up your sleeve if somebody did leave for whatever reason. So again, that a really good tip. I know that sometimes that's financial challenges, which tends to be a fear, but if you've got a good business, then that you certainly fill it up pretty quick. So what are some things you'd recommend in building a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help with growth? Yeah, that's a good one as well, because culture is so hard. It's really, really a big challenge for any business, I think. What I've found over my journey is the key to a good culture is to be honest with your people, even if that's a little confronting at times. They like honesty. You can't make a promise to somebody and not give it to them. That creates a poor culture. Certainly communication, making sure that people are in the loop and they understand what's going on and not just sporadic communication. It needs to be continuous communication. So for us, we've created Cooper News. We will put on events 
that are occurring. Different people of the executive team will communicate different things. On Cooper News, we've got an in-house trainer who trains all our technical staff and our apprentices. He loads technical advice and what would you say, he will show jobs that have been done in our workshops and how we've solved them for everybody to be able to see how these different problems played out. He does that sort of technical posts. The general manager will do posts around safe and training. I'll do posts around acquisition and growth. Everybody, and that goes to every staff member who has social media, and I think we all do bar, bar one in our group. So they're always informed around where the business is going, what it's doing, what their part is in that journey. It just, as I said earlier, it just takes away those silos. And people need to be heard and, and feel valued. Most people will go to work, not just for the paycheck, but to add value in some fashion. They want to feel as though they're an important part of the business and they've got a sense of worth in what they do every day. And I think that honesty, the communication, keeping everybody in the loop, listening to what people say, acting on what they say, and acting on what they say might come back to them and say, look, no, that's not a good idea for the following reasons. It might not be that you have to implement the idea or make change. You just need to go back to them and let them know that you've listened. But I think a few key points there, really, it's just around that honesty, communication, and people feeling valued. Yeah, and I, I agree. You can never over communicate, and too many businesses under communicate. What I find is people in the businesses, if there is under communication, they just make the shit up. They'll they just make assumptions. Say you better be, as you say, clear in your communication, regular in your communication, and consistent, and it makes a big difference. So putting the process in place, essentially, around that. Yeah, and that's a key yeah. what you said there too, Michael, yeah. is that uh, if, if there's a vacuum of information, people will fill the void. Found that timely communication is incredibly important with anything that's significant within the business. Uh, an employee that's been with you for 10 years leaves, that, uh, you know, something that would be significant to the other employees that needs to be communicated straight away. By their silence, rumour mill starts and people start to, to create a story, which is nine times out of 10, not fact. Correct. No, spot on. So tell the audience how you have to handle balance, mate. I don't necessarily really like the term work-life balance. I find it's more how you've integrated your personal and, and business life because it is part of your life, right? How have you handled that and uh, do you think you've done it very well over the journey? Yeah, I'm not sure I've actually <laughs> managed to affect it. I had a bit of a mind shift change. I'm not quite sure when. It was a number of years ago where I realised it's not business and it's not personal and it's not friends. You can't separate those areas of your life out. To me, it was 24-7, seven, seven days a week, and I just needed to get all that stuff in. Now, that sounds like it's not a big mind shift, but it is a significant mind shift because it doesn't mean you're working from 8 to 5 or 9 to 5, depending on your job. It means that if I want to go and have lunch with someone in the middle of the day, that's fine. I might work till 6 o'clock that night to catch up. What that meant was it didn't mean I, on weekends you would do no work. I might do some work on weekends, but that might allow me to do something else during the week. What I found was instead of trying to separate those things out, your personal life and your work life, is you go, I've got this amount of time to fit it all in. And then the second thing that probably has helped me over the years is to prioritize. Your friends and your family are the most important and your health and then your work comes last. So I sort of put it into health, family, friends, and then work. Now, obviously work will try and overtake all the time. That's what it does. It'll consume any time you want to give it. But if you put your health first, so for argument's sake, I go to the gym in the morning or I'll jump on my push bike in the morning and go for a ride. Because I find if I don't, I'll still be at work at 6 p.m. and then I'm too tired to go and do any physical exercise. And as you know, Michael, you ride bikes pretty fit and keep yourself active. Is that time on the bike or in the gym or walking the dogs is a great time to think as well. So even though it's, it's giving you that downtime and that health benefit, you're also getting that time to process thoughts, which may be about the business or family or anything else you need to do but it really is a great time and then you just got to make sure that you're not neglecting your friends and families because when you're finished work what have you got left you've got your health your friends and your family those three got to come first because eventually work goes away but hopefully those three don't no, good one. As you say, I'm very big on that sort of stuff and prioritising everything is so important. And as you say, family and your health has got to be uh, number one without nearly exception. If you don't get those right, then it just impacts on business one way or another anyway. Really got to step back and focus on that stuff and, and give it appropriate time and energy because it'll pay you back. And it sounds like that's you know, your approach has certainly paid you back in spades. Yeah, absolutely. And the health's a key one because just take a hangover. I think everyone could probably relate to a hangover. How much do you get? done on a day when you've got a hangover next to nothing there's no concentration there's no drive there's no desire think about that from a health perspective if you're not alive you don't have energy you're not feeling good you're not going to be able to drive the work outcomes that you need to drive you're not going to be able to spend quality time with your friends and family your health has to be number one you've got to be right before you can take
take care of anything else. Definitely, it's got to be in that order. Yeah, professional development made over the journey. Have you invested much in that? Look, I've invested a lot of time and money in personal development. I've been very lucky in a way. Obviously, I did my, back in the early days, it was more around the trade itself as a motor mechanic and then an auto electrician and then an automotive technician. And and I always like to learn diagnostics and new skills in that particular space. And then later on, when I got into business, I started to do marketing seminars, finance seminars, small business planning seminars. I did a cert for in small business management. I did the mastermind group with Mel Emery that I mentioned earlier, which was a great way to learn some marketing techniques. And then in 2008, it was a, I decided I'd like to know if what I did in practice was actually correct from a theoretical point of view. So I went to university in 2008, which is when I opened my fifth store in that year as well, and did a uh, graduate certificate in commercialization, which I got honors for and really, really enjoyed. And what that told me was that what I'd worked out through trial and error and losing a lot of money was actually correct theoretically based. I'd actually worked out the right way to do things, but I'd worked it out from a practical sense but it was a great confidence booster because it gave me the understanding that I actually knew what I was doing and was doing it correctly as far as I really found that quite helpful and I got elected to the Board of Capricorn which is an automotive buying group it's a cooperative based in Perth, West Australia and I got onto the board in October 2013 which incidentally was the same time I purchased paint shops so that wasn't particularly good timing that was a steep learning curve but the good thing about being on that board is that they they really uh, value learning outcomes and I've managed to attend seminars and train training events all around the world as part of that role, which has been immensely helpful. Good experience, as you say, all part of uh, your general uh, professional development. Talk about mentors or coaches along the way. Have you had any of those? Yeah, look, I have, and I probably haven't done that particularly well because I tend to get a mentor or a coach when I'm in crisis. But I suppose it has worked in a sense that they've helped me with that particular problem at that particular time. And I would certainly recommend uh, mentors and coaches, whether that's something you do continuously or whether it's something that you turn on and off during your journey, depending on the needs of the business and you would get, look, highly rate coaching and mentors. I think as a business owner, it's lonely at the top and you can't know everything. And that network of people and coaches and mentors incredibly important. And I think I find as a business coach myself, one of the key aspects that business owners value is being held accountable, which seems a bit weird in itself. But like you say, it's, it's lonely at the top. You're not necessarily accountable to anybody. So to have some accountability and to keep focus is really important. And someone outside looking in from time to time as a sounding board, as you say, can be lonely. So reaching out to mentors and coaches is really important and part of your growth journey. Do you have a board of directors or advisors? No, not a board. As I said, we would bring independent consultants or um coaches or mentors in depending on where yep. we're at and what we're trying to achieve. Yeah. Final five question, mate. What do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business? It's really the fact it's a lifestyle, not a job. You're on 24-7. You can't escape that 24-7. It's in your head, even if you're not there, you're thinking about it. I know that you said, what's the hardest thing? But I'd say the other thing, <laughs> I'm going to give you two. I'd say <laughs> the other thing is the cash to grow the business. It's hard initially to get that cash, to get the momentum. Yeah. What about your favourite business book, which has helped you the most? I'm going to give you two again. I'm not going to give you one. My most favourite book ever is Losing My Virginity by Richard Branson. I just couldn't put that down. I thought that was absolutely fantastic and it inspired me to do some great things on my journey. And the book that helped me most early on would be the E-Myth. It helped me understand what I've actually done. I'd be, you know, I'd, I'd actually got that trade or profession and then got into business without any idea around what the hell I was doing. I found both those books to be really good. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned E-Myth. I think any person that starts out in business, that's probably as good as read as you're going to have as a, nearly a Bible, right? Yeah, that's a that good one. And to Richard Branson, great story. What about any great podcasts or online learning tools you use for PD? Yeah, well, How to Grow a Small Business, of course. We'd, we'd have to give that one a, a tick. The Deal Room, I like that podcast. And the Business Buying Strategy podcast I've also found pretty good by Jonathan Jay. It's a great one to listen to. And one tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business? A dashboard of, of key metrics and whatever program you use. It could be Power BI, but you need to know what key drivers are of your business and you need to monitor them daily. Yeah, I think uh, you just mentioned Power BI and certainly we spoke about that years ago. I think it's an underappreciated uh, tool and resource for businesses. So part of Microsoft Suites can mm. be very powerful. That's a, a really good one as far as specifically. And the last question, mate, what would you tell yourself on day one of starting out? Well, looking back on day one, I'd tell myself to do some business courses before I started getting <laughs> into business. As I said to you earlier, Mike, when we were having a bit of a chat before the podcast, when I first started in business and my accountant uh, was doing the books, he said, you're missing three 
three checks. And I said, what do you mean I'm missing three checks? He said, well, you haven't reconciled them in the bank account. And I said, what do you mean reconcile the bank account? So in the early days, I didn't even know that I had to reconcile uh, a bank account. My advice would be, yeah, do a, read a few books or learn a little bit about business before you actually open the doors. Yeah, Matt, a good one, mate. So look, appreciate your time. It's been a great chat. I really enjoyed it, uh, listening to your journey and fantastic insights and tips for the small business owners that are really on in their journey and hopefully to help them navigate through uh, what's in front of them. So thanks again, mate. No, excellent. Thanks for having me on the show. We're getting some great iTunes reviews. For those listening, please pop over to your podcast app and leave us a review.